Welcome to I-24 News Defense, your weekly look into security, intelligence and strategic affairs. In this edition, no let up in the wave of terror in Israel and the West Bank. How much of it is inspired by the Islamic State? Behind Saudi Arabia's massive military spending. And a look at how drone technology is becoming a mainstay in civilian life. Two and a half months into the wave of violence and terror sweeping Israel and the West Bank, 23 Israelis and foreigners have been murdered in terror attacks so far. More than 70 Palestinians have been killed, most of them as they were launching an attack in what the Islamic movement Hamas is calling a third intifada and the Palestinian Authority calls breakout. Here are some of the images from just this last week. And joining us now from Herzliya is Professor Boaz Gano, founder and executive director of the International Institute for Counterterrorism. Professor Gano, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, Alan. With more than 20 Israeli casualties in the last two months, more than 200 attacks, mostly carried out by individuals, how would you define what Israel is experiencing now? Alon, what we are facing in the last two months is a wave of terrorism, uh, a wave of a certain type of terrorism that we define as personal initiative attacks. Um, some uh, refers to that as a lone wolf attack. The personal initiative attack is, is an outcome of uh, inspiration or incitement, if you wish. Uh, there are people which are trying to incite uh, uh, others uh, to, uh, to commit terrorist attacks. In a way, I know it sounds weird, but in a way, it's not that different from the lone wolf attacks that we see in the Western countries today by uh, people that have been radicalized by ISIS. So you see an influence of the ISIS spirit in what Israel is going through right now? In a way, yes. Uh, again, I, I don't want to, uh, to argue as if uh, those are two connected phenomena, but you know, it's a small world out there, and uh, everybody is seeing what the others are doing and being inspired by that as well. The Palestinians have their own mo motivation. Uh, the spark for this wave of terrorism was uh, incitement coming from uh, Hamas and then later on uh, being taken uh, by Abu Mazen, even King Ab Abdullah, not intentionally, but uh, <coughs> based on... Uh, the claim that Israel is changing the status quo in Al-Aqsa Al Mosque. That's actually uh, flame uh, everything. When you add to that uh, the fact that uh, the Palestinians are seeing what is happening in the uh, um, Western countries with the personal initiative attacks, with lone wolves attacks, you can see that there was uh, some kind of a connection, although the motives, of course, behind that was totally uh, totally different. But in recent weeks, we're seeing more attacks launched using guns. Do you think that signals a shift in what used to be mostly a stabbing intifada? That's an interesting question. Uh, there is uh, uh, such a trend as we see that uh, we see less stabbing and more gun shooting. I still would not give this too much importance because as far as I know, those are not, uh, um, these are not members of a terrorist organization that are uh, getting guns from the organization and conducting the attack. Those are people that happen to have or not happen intentionally having guns in their house. Uh, they have been radicalized like those which are stabbing, uh, 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 but they have a better uh, tool in their hands, and this is not a knife, this is a gun. So 
the, the whole idea is the same idea. P please stay with us, uh, Professor Ogano, because uh, with us in the studio, I want to join into the discussion. Uh, I-24 News correspondent Muhammad El Qasim, you spent a lot of time in Hebron in the last few weeks. Hebron is uh, launching more than 50% of the terrorists so far. What's the explanation for that? Why Hebron? Well, well, why Hebron? We have a, about three reasons to why the people of Hebron uh, uh, say that they are the uh, launching pad for these attacks first. They say that there is a high concentration of Jewish settlement in the area where uh, Palestinians and the Israeli settlers come uh, very close to each other physically. Unlike the, any other major Palestinian city. The only uh, comparison we can make is close to Jerusalem. south of Naples uh, and also around Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But in that area with the Gosh Atzion uh, settlements around there and Kiryat Arba, uh, Hebron uh, people as well as uh, villages around, they, they share roads, they come very close to them. Sometimes they live within meters uh, away from each other. The second reason is uh, let's not forget that Hebron is a hotbed for Hamas, and Hamas is very popular uh, in Hebron. And also many uh, people in Hebron believe that the majority of those who Israel says committed uh, attacks, Hebron people say that they don't believe it. They say that knives and any other weapon that was used have been put and implanted by the Israeli army. And they don't think that uh, these Palestinians actually committed any of these attacks. Yeah, I noticed how, how spread this rumor became in uh, Hebron. Let's go back to uh, Professor Gano and talk uh, a bit about Europe. A lot has been said about the lack of cooperation between European intelligence agencies. Do you think that the uh, Paris attacks are a turning point in the way Europe will fight against terrorism? Well, you know, I cannot uh, predict uh, if it will be a turning point of no or not, but it is a turning point in the, uh, um, the uh, modus operandi of, uh, of ISIS. And therefore, I tend to believe that the security services in Europe should take this under consideration and act accordingly and change their own doctrines, uh, the level of cooperation, and so on and so forth. What we saw in the attacks in Paris uh, uh, almost two weeks ago was that... Uh, 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 ISIS adopted the modus operandi of Al-Qaeda, which is not relying anymore just on inspiration attack, uh, lone wolf's attacks, or, or uh, local independent network of a uh, uh, few members of family uh, that have been radicalized together and being inspired by ISIS to conduct the attack. What we see in, uh, in the last uh, uh, attacks uh, conducted by ISIS are organized attacks, either sleeper cells or infiltrating cell or a combination of the two. This is a new ballgame. This is a bigger challenge to the uh, intelligence services and security services. By the way, in organized attacks, the security services and intelligence services has much better opportunities to infiltrate into the uh, planning and preparation of the attack stage before it's being conducted and prevent the attack. This is why, from my point of view, uh, the uh, attacks in Paris uh, represent a real intelligence failure uh, from the side of, uh, of French uh, intelligence and, I would say, all uh, European intelligence. Professor Gano, thank you very much for this interview. After the Paris attacks, in particular, much focus has turned to the uh, Syrian war and the countries involved. But uh, meanwhile, another major proxy war is still playing out between Iran and Saudi Arabia in Yemen. Mohammed El Qasim, you bring us a look at Saudi Arabia's goals and the money it's pouring into them. In the ever volatile Middle East, the Saudi Kingdom is an unarmed spending race. The Desert Kingdom comes in fourth in the world in military spending just behind the U.S. and China. Saudi Arabia spent at least $80 billion on military hardware last year. That's 10.4% of the kingdom's GDP. And it's five times what Iran spent in the same year. By contrast, Washington's enormous military expenditure, over $571 billion, 3.5% of its GDP. But it's not just the statistics. The astronomical numbers reflect serious concerns by the Saudi royal family, fueled by regional instability, notably in Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, where the kingdom is deeply involved in a proxy war with Iran. The kingdom's military is one of the most modern and powerful forces in the Middle East. With the political unrest of the Arab Spring and Iran's growing influence across the region, autocratic Sunni regimes like Saudi Arabia are turning their focus to security. 
Mohamed El Qasim, we are seeing this massive uh, Saudi spending. What are the objectives, the strategic <coughs> objectives of Saudi Arabia behind that? The main objective is for the Saudi royal family to place itself and place the country as the main Sunni uh, Muslim and Arab leader of those uh, two uh, areas. The Arab leader, the Arab countries, as well as the Islamic world, as we know, the uh, you know Saudi Arabia has the is the guardian of the holiest uh, two places uh, for uh, Muslims. And and uh, the war in Yemen right now, reports have been indicating that the Houthis are on the decline, that Iran is losing the war. Is that really the situation? Contrary to the reports, I think the war in Yemen now there is no clear winner. Winner, uh, whether it's the Saudis and the uh, Yemeni uh, government uh, backed by the Saudis or the Houthis by backed by the Iranians and the Russians. In fact, there are credible reports that says that Saudi Arabia got itself in a quagmire in Yemen. That's uh, the the war there is putting a huge burden than economically on Saudi Arabia in the face of uh, uh, oil prices that have been very, very low, which uh, Saudi Arabia is facing a huge deficit now uh, financially. So you expect them to withdraw soon? They're trying. They're trying to withdraw from Yemen, uh, keeping some dignity uh, uh, and, and it's respectful uh, you know, withdrawal. They're trying very hard, and they're working on it. And I expect them to, in the next few months, that uh, they withdraw from Yemen. And what is the role of the UAE in this uh, war? All we hear about in Yemen is the Saudi uh, military uh, uh, forces there. But actually, the ones that's doing the dirty work on the ground in Yemen is United Arab Emirates, which is the uh, comes in second place among Arab countries with its military expenditures. Uh, it's, it, it, so far, uh, last year, United Arab Emirates, Emirates um, basically spent $22 billion. That's more than what Iran spent, which is $50 billion on military expenditure. And the Egyptians are also placing a maritime siege on, on Yemen? They are. They are. They're, they're involved on the side of the uh, Saudis, even though they're trying to play uh, a balanced role also, saying that they're not taking, uh, you know, uh, sides with, each, with the, either side. However, they are uh, still on the Saudi side. So active conflicts all across the Middle East. Thank you very much, Mohammed El Qasim. My pleasure. <laughs> The use of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones in the military sphere has become a fixture of modern warfare, but drones are also increasingly making their way into civilian life. I-24 News went to a technology summit in Tel Aviv to take a look at why and how. An international summit on unmanned vehicles in Tel Aviv. The event seems tailored to Israel since the so-called startup nation is a pioneer in drone technology. In attendance is Mississippi Governor Phil Bryant. His state is a model in the development of unmanned vehicle tech, in agriculture in particular. The U.S. drone industry includes close to 100,000 employees, with a turnover of some $82 billion a year. In the state of Mississippi, we have a strong relationship with Israel. This is the largest trade mission we have. So I was speaking here today at the UAV conference. We have 120 aerospace industries in Mississippi, one Stark Aerospace related with IAI. And so we have a lot of friends and business associates here. U.S. officials are always a mainstay at these events, but this year reps from Mexico were the most numerous in Tel Aviv. In a country subject to the rule of powerful drug cartels, security has become a master word. Last October, the Israeli company Aeronautics sold its largest drone to the Mexican government, to the delight of General Salcido. Concerning the fight against terror, we have acquired drones essentially to survey oil sites across Mexico. With this technology, we can exercise strict supervision Supervision. This is a good example of our cooperation with Israel, which is very limited. Behind the conference is David Harari, considered in Israel as the father of drones for the UAVs he developed in the 70s. Today, he notes a shift of military technology towards the civilian, a small revolution. You see these buttons? They allow you to control a camera and other embedded systems. It's a major evolution. Imagine a farmer who will have a small unmanned plane to survey his crops. By air, land or sea, unmanned vehicles are a prolific market that's here to stay. And on the civilian side, may be introducing more major changes to our future. And that's all we have time for. Be sure to visit us again next week for another edition of I-24 News Defense. For all the latest headlines, log on to i24news.tv. Have a safe night from the Jaffa Port.